Hello, I'm Jason Davis and welcome to a special interview with the 5th Governor General of the Federation of St. Christopher and Nevis, Her Excellency Dame Marcella Liburd, GCMG, JP. We're going to be speaking a bit with her to find out about you know, how she feels as the most recent Governor General and we'll be learning a bit about the post of the Governor General itself. Hello and welcome, Your Excellency. Thank you and welcome to Government House Lawns. <laughs> <laughs> I feel it's a little brighter with you here. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So let's get right into it. We've got right. quite a bit to talk about. First of all, how did you feel when you were informed that you were going to be the next Governor General? It was a little surreal. Um, and I was hesitant. So I had to think long and hard about it. Knowing, you know, what it probably means. Of course, you will not know the full impact of it until you're there, but you have some idea as to what it is like to be the Governor General, you have some idea, and so it wasn't something that I really was saying, okay, and jump and do it, you know. But I gave it some serious thought, and then in the end, I agreed. To, to walk us through that moment, how did you find out? How were you notified? Well, the Prime Minister, he called me and he said that um, they were thinking about some persons to be the Governor General, and I was one of the names. So from since that, we they will call every now and again to find out, you know, what my position was on it, and it went from there. For persons who might not know, what's the actual process of selecting a governor general? I think it's the government mm -hmm. who makes the recommendation, and the process involves um, writing to Buckingham Palace and, and informing them. I don't think it is not that they have a say in it, but you have to inform them and then they in turn would produce the necessary documentation to have the person installed as the Governor General. Okay. Now you've been in office for several weeks now. So what what does the Governor General do on a daily basis? What's an average day for you like? I've been in for a little over a month. <laughs> I didn't like the several weeks. <laughs> A little over a month. Mm -hmm. um, interestingly, there is a perception that the Governor General is like the Queen's, in this case the King's representative. And so you sit here probably waiting on the King or the Queen. I don't know what that means, but people have that view and so they think, well, what do you do? But one of the serious responsibilities of the Governor General is to ensure that you carry out the constitutional demands of the Governor General. And I don't believe that many people take time out to read the Constitution, what it says the Governor General is supposed to do. And so, for example, you have to be um, in on all government appointments all government contracts, all government disciplinary measures. And um, so it's, it's not just an easy job sitting down here waiting for the king. Um, and so you have to ensure that you really understand what your role is with respect to the constitution. And for those who thought that it was just, you know, the queen's representative, I'm sure the recent elections and the part that the government general was asked to play, would that allow, let you know that is much more than that. So, when you said you're involved or you have a role to play, in, as you said, government appointments and disciplinary measures, what, what kind of a role uh, do you have to sign off or you just need to be informed? What kind of a role? You have to sign off on all of them. Mm -hmm. um, there's a misconception by some people to believe that you, because of that, that you have some say in who, who is appointed, for example, but you don't have a say in it. When you read the Constitution, you have a say, but you still have to sign it once the Public Service Commission sends that to you. You would then have to sign off on it, but it's not just in my humble opinion, we were stamping what they do, even though you can say, well, not to our early or supporting you. So your role is to, again, ensure that the process, because the Constitution has a process that the Public Service Commission must follow. And so 
you have to ensure that they are following that process because you really can't be signing off on something where the process itself is not in accordance with the constitution. That kind of brings me to my next question. In the process of you know, signing off on these appointments, etc., etc., mm -hmm. do, would the Governor General, um, having his or her prior knowledge of a person, be able to say, um, I do not, or I, I have reservations about this person having this position? Well, if you're asking me personally, I won't do that mm -hmm. because that is not part of my role. Mm -hmm. My role is to ensure that the process at the PST level is followed as done in accordance with the constitution what the constitution say that the public service commission or the police service commission whichever it is must do i see so now this which brings to uh, 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 the overall question which some persons have mentioned on social media with the um push in uh, most recent times for some caribbean persons for caribbean nations sorry to distance themselves from the monarchy there's the question is the position of governor general even relevant in this day and age what's your thoughts it's still very relevant because what do you do until you reach that stage have a vacuum so again it's all about transition but um the governor general that's our history right and Yes, some of us may like it to be, uh, you know, uh, uh, far history, past history. But again, it's a process. So until you reach that stage, you still have to have the Governor General. And like I, I told you, it's not a question of just representing the British monarchy. So if the Governor General is not relevant, what happens to all these um, appointments and so on, that the Constitution, you have a serious constitutional role. Right? I mean, right now, as you know, I mean, let's be honest, there's a lot of talk about appointing a leader, the opposition saying need this. That is something that the Governor General has to do. So it's not just a question, it has to be that the, the position is extremely important for the good governance of St. Kitts and Nevis. Is the Governor General ever involved in consultations when it comes to laws and whatnot? Or are, is the post just there at the end to sign off? What I would say is that the Constitution, again, my role is to carry out my, the constitutional requirements. The constitution says that the, the cabinet must meet with the governor general and keep the governor general informed. And so right now we've set up regular meetings. We had one already with the prime minister, monthly meetings to carry out that particular constitutional function. So within that, there is scope to discuss all these matters. Mm -hmm. Okay, but it's just uh, uh, an in for, for the purpose of informing, not necessarily consultation. Well, um, it's a question of semantics, mm -hmm. but I believe that you can have some say, you know, some input. You know, I'm not saying that you have to accept your input, but you can have some input because that is the whole purpose of having these monthly discussions about informing what the government is doing, but also sharing views on what the government is doing but it wouldn't make any sense i see now we cannot avoid the fact that you're the first female governor general it's been described as a historic moment and it is it's, it's the first time in this nation's history we've ever ever had a woman as our governor general how significant is, is that appointment in uh, how significant is that detail in your opinion i think it's extremely important because I, for one, um, got that from my mother, of course. <laughs> I've always been an advocate for the empowerment of women. And so I think the appointment of the first woman sends a very strong message that resonates throughout the Federation of St. and Leaders that women can be whatever they want to be, they can be at the very top. And so it's, it's a very strong message that is being sent to the women of this country and the young girls. And um, as international women, their approaches and guess it takes on even more significance. I was about to allude to that, you know, how, how you know, it's almost, what was the word serendipity? I think it is the word. Yeah, yeah that, that your appointment comes just a month or so before the uh, uh, acknowledged observance of International Women's Day. Right. Right. So, um, what would, you, you touched on it before, but could you speak a bit about, more about this? You know, what do you want young women to take away from this milestone for them to understand that there's nothing really stopping you from being whatever you want to be and that is a 
big message that I wanted to understand. You know, we have grown up in societies where women seem to have limited scope, limited opportunities, certain jobs and so on, or those are for men and, you know, I think we're getting long way past that, but we still have a long way to go. And so, more than anything else, I want it to be a reaffirmation of the fact that young girls, women, go for your dreams. Now, I know the previous Governor General, he had a, a connection to heritage mm -hmm. and he was involved with the, with the St. Christopher National Trust. Being such a big advocate of women empowerment, will you also be reaching out to lend your support to such endeavors? Of course. Very much so. That is why um, the, the past Governor General, he also had some input in the what is going to be the museum at, at the old home of, of Sir Robert Bratzer. And we are going to try to play our part in, in ensuring that that becomes a reality. Mm -hmm. Why? There has been some talk about not enough female representation in positions of power, particularly politics. Right. Why do you think that is? First of all, it's partly a society's sort of perception of the role of women. We're still not there yet, but certainly it's getting much better where people believe that women shouldn't really be in politics, for example. You know, they should be more concerned about looking after the, the children and making sure that their husband and significant others are well taken care of and leave these other matters to men. And that has long been our view. Um, and many women believe that too. So it, it sort of doesn't help in that regard. But with lots of efforts by persons who are pushing, who are advocates of women empowerment, we're able to get past a lot of these obstacles. And we're at a point now where I think that that will soon be a thing of the past. Well, not soon enough, but soon. I mean, I'm so happy that today, as we speak here in St. Kitts and Nevis, um, we are seeing first time so many women in the parliament. And so I think that is a very good start and for other women to be encouraged and to understand that you too could be there. You have had a long and very decorated career in within politics, being right. a constitu constituency representative, speaker of the house, and even an acting prime minister at right. one point in time. Now, what can you tell uh, the average woman out there or young women who might be watching this interview who are unsure of whether or not to go into politics, particularly because of what society may have told them before? I was told when I did my training with Cyril, because I did some training with Cyril, the Caribbean Women um, Institute that helps women who go into politics, that politics is a bloody sport. And it is. <laughs> and that's one reason why women don't go in either, because they will hear, you know, all manner of things. And I think it deters them when they're faced with, you know, that sort of um, reality. However, what I would say to them, I will tell them what my mother told me growing up all along. And that is what stayed with me. I remember the first interview I had when I was running for office. The interviewer asked me probably a similar question and I'm giving, him, I'm giving you the same answer he gave me. Because what she said to me was, don't let anyone define you. And I think if young girls and women live with that, don't let anyone define you, then you can go into politics, you can do anything, because all of the talk and all of the thing wouldn't mean anything. As I always say, it would be like water on a duck's back. Once you know who you are, then you can proceed. So what do you think needs to be done to create a, a, a framework or an environment where women uh, are, have are more able to enter the political arena? There has to be more support from men, from women, but more importantly to me, there has to be a conscious effort to train young girls to be leaders. 
I think it comes naturally for men for some reason maybe because of our society views leadership right whether in the church there are still some churches where women can take the, the platform in the church and so and um, as some people say you know in, 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 in the home itself I think that all marriage vows still say that um, women must subject themselves to their husbands no there are several interpretations of what subject yourself means, but I know that many people interpret it to mean that, you know, you do whatever the man tells you to do, even if he says, go and sort to run over a cliff. So those are the kind of things that we have to change those perceptions. So from inside the family, we have to let our young girls and so on know that they can be leaders, they can be anything. I think maybe the schools need to, as part of whether the civics or the curriculum, teach leadership. Yeah, sometimes it's not going to come that naturally, um, especially to young girls, that them understand that leadership is across the board so that we can then have more women willingly going into say, political life and see more equity in the world. Recently, uh, in that vein, there was a mentorship series called Women Empowering Girls. I right. don't know if you're aware of that. Aware of what are your thoughts on that type of movement? Well, I think that's the right direction. You know, something like that. Is it, you can't just leave it up to chance. You have to have something like that. Because one of the anomalies is that we said women needed to be educated from way back. And now we have so many women, I mean, to the point where the, the boys and so on were falling behind, right? So we have all these educated women, masters, doctorates and so on, but it's not being reflected in the board rooms, the leadership of the board rooms, because the private sector also, you know, there's so few women who are really at the very top of the, of the private sector. So it's both the private and the public sector that we need to see some changes. And we're seeing more changes in the public sector right now than we're seeing in the private sector in that regard. Now, recently, you were also part of an award ceremony for women in sport. Right. Uh, there were several awards. You yourself were given an award. Tell right. me about that experience. It was a wonderful experience for me because I've been a sports person all my life. As you know, I played sport at the very top level. But coaches, for some reason or other, don't seem to get the recognition and the acknowledgement that they should get. I mean, you watch sports, even not just here in Tengiz and Nevis, but all over. And you would notice that when the teams are winning, it's the players. They're great. When you acknowledge the coaches is when they're losing. And then you say, well, who coaching that team there? And the coach sort of comes into the limelight when the team loses. So I'm really happy that the um, SKNOC took time out to acknowledge coaches because that's very important because I'm sure many of them well I know when I was a coach it, it's a voluntary thing I don't know how many of them are paid coach maybe some of them are in this day and age but it's basically a voluntary thing and the the the, the burdens on the coach because when I was a coach I mean a netball coach I was a mother and um, first aid um, looking jobs you know trying to quell a relationship issues you, you just everything you know so because again if the players are not um, emotionally stable you don't get the best out of them so it's very important for you don't just think that you come to coach netball or whatever the sport is and you can ignore what else is going on in life for the players so coaches play a major role and so i was really happy that they're being recognized at that level. Well, since we're on the topic of sport, what role did sport play in shaping you as an individual? Major. And that's why I encourage any young girl, any young boy to play sport. Because the lessons you learn, apart from keeping you healthy, because exercise, you know, um, is part of being healthy, it teaches you teamwork. And as you know, teamwork is not just on the netball field or the football field. It's up to that end, you know, right on your job. If you don't have team players there, you cannot get through with the work that you want to get done. So it teaches you that more than anything else. It also teaches you discipline because you have to be there at a certain time 
and that's so critical, especially in St. Kitts and Nevis. You know, where time is always like an issue, but it teaches you discipline, it teaches you team spirit, it teaches you how to relate to other human beings. Because, for example, um, my very, very good friends were people who I traveled with as netball players. Because when you travel, you live together. And so that establishes a kind of bond that's, that we have for life. So it teaches you quite a bit about life that I think all of us need to experience. Do you think that um, enough young women are getting involved in sports to tap into these uh, benefits on their, for their entire life? Well, if I, if I could speak for netball, I certainly don't think so. As a matter of fact, I would like to see a resurgence of netball. And as we speak of netball, I don't know if you're aware, but this year makes the 50th anniversary since we had our 1973 championships and, and our 45th anniversary of the 1978 championship. So we have won two Caribbean championships. And again, you can back check this, but I don't know any other sport that has um, won a Caribbean championships for St. Kitts. I, I know we have cricket and football who may be Leeward Island champion. But when I say Caribbean champion, I'm talking about beating Trinidad, you know, being ahead of Jamaica and all these other places. And, and to add to that, um, we won in 73, we won in 78, and we went to the World Championships in 79 and placed fifth in the world. And the people who were ahead of us, Trinidad was very good at that time. I think they had a joint winner with someone the big teams like Australia and New Zealand for first place. So the next part was third place when you have this joint winner. And so between third and fourth, now you had the other team with Australia, New Zealand, England, and then Zagreb. So again, so it's it's a little bit of a peer for me to see that you know what netball you know is like now, and so that is probably one of the things I may think about in terms of trying to see if we could get a resurgence so that we can help the young girls to be more involved in the sport. Well, tapping into your knowledge with the sports and your years of experience with the sports, what do you think is needed? How do we bring back or breathe new life into netball? It's a lot of hard work. Mm -hmm. um, but you have to have people who are committed and people who are not looking to get paid. And right now, that's a very difficult thing because everybody wants to be paid for every single thing. People no longer seem to volunteer for anything but we need to get some committed people and personally I think what they need to do is to start to to go to every single community in in St. Kitts and try to establish a netball team there and that's where they have to start and that would mean getting coaches for each of these communities so that they go out and, and begin to coach young girls to play the game again um, for every community I think once that is done, you'll be able to get more teams playing in the tournament because the more community teams you establish, the more them likely to want to participate in the tournament. And then once you do that, then you'll bring back a lot of these communities to Netball City because they will now come to see their community team playing. And that to me would help with a resurgence in the game. You're obviously very passionate about Netball. What's, what is it about the sport? Um. One of the things you ask me about what it teaches you about life, um, winning and losing. It teaches you to win, teaches you to lose, and this is something you need for life. Because some people become devastated when they lose, you know, and sometimes losing may be good for you because you, you then know where you, you have to go to look to improve, you know. But one of the things about netball that is unique to me is the quintessential team sport. There's no other sport where you must involve another player in order, say, like to score a goal. In football, one player can take the ball, ch -ch -ch -ch, go through all the players and score mm -hmm. alone. Basketball, same thing. I don't have to tell you about singles tennis, but in netball, there's no way anybody could go from one end to the next and score a goal on their own. You have to involve somebody else. And so that is why it's so important because it teaches you 
how to relate to your team members even more because you have to have that other person in order for you to score goals. Okay. Um, okay, so we've touched on sports. We've touched on your political career. Um, we didn't get to talk about much about your educational background. You were a teacher for quite a few years. How did you get involved in teaching? That's a good question. Um, I don't quite remember how I got involved in it, <laughs> but I could tell you that I loved it. Mm -hmm. I taught for 18 years. Um, I think that I have a very good rapport with people, generally, and um, anybody who is in teaching should, because you have to love people in order to uh, want them to do well. And so, um, for me, I love teaching. I used to teach and coach, and coaching is a form of teaching. <laughs> well, it is teaching. In a so, I love doing that. And one of the things that um, I was able to do fairly successfully as a teacher was to individualize the teaching, right? I find a lot of uh, teachers, you know, they, 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 they teach, you know, a class. But in every class, there are students who are not at the same level. So you have to find that mean as to how you challenge those who may be a little ahead but still don't lose those who are, who are behind. And if you have that also individual touch, you'll be able to ensure that every student gets over the line. And so you have a very high pass rate for that reason. And all my students, I mean, up to today, you know, um, we still have a relationship because of that. And that's great. Now, we've been speaking about the role of women in various sectors. I, I personally feel that there's a very high percentage of women within th the teaching sector. Right. So I don't think we can say that there's underrepresentation there. But are there any improvements that you'd like to see in the teaching sector which may impact women? Well, I'm not very familiar with what is happening in teaching, you know, firsthand right now. But just talking of the way our society is. I would really like to see a little more individual attention being paid to the students, which is what I spoke about, because they're going through sometimes, all of us, as you know, in the society, the open to, you know, gangs and other things. I think it, if we find a way to encourage teachers and to train them to be a little more individual with the students and perhaps it may make it better for the classroom and certainly for all of us but um i know that's very difficult because when i speak to some teachers they say oh you know that person you know like it's a lost soul they look at. but i don't know i don't write anybody off all right. Well, we're almost out of time, so I would like to ask you, what are your hopes for the future um, as GG? We started off with you asking me what my day is like, what the role of the GG is. I know for a fact that the public isn't aware of what the role of the GG is. They have, like I said, perceptions of what it is, and a lot of the time perceptions are not right and so I, I plan to engage on a little what I call project of educating the public especially children about the history of government house and the role of the government general the constitutional role and the other uh, roles that the government general perform um, I believe that we go a long way in helping us understand fully what the Governor General does, what impact that has on the communities, and certainly may open up the eyes of others to want to be the Governor General one day. Well, it sounds like you have quite the task ahead of you, and I wish you all the best in making that a reality. Thank you. Uh, thank you for speaking with us. Thank you. I've been speaking with the Governor General of St. Christopher and Nevis, Her Excellency Dame Marcella Libre, GCMG JP. We've been speaking a bit about the post of the Governor General, sir, her influences and some of her plans for the future. Thank you for joining us. I'm Jason Davis from Government House for ZIZ TV.